There was a conversation saying, well, isn't there a way to just know what herbs to give people because it gets so complicated? And so um, I, I like dragon herbs. I don't have any stake in it or anything, but um, I like it because they're organic Chinese herbs. And in the back of the book, and I brought two of them, um, they talk about like ca cardiovascular health, um, chronic fatigue, etc. And they show you various uh, herbs that they recommend to take. So it's a table situation. I know most doctors like everything in a table. So, sorry, I didn't mean it that way. But it just makes it simpler and easier. Because I think that, that was your question last time. Do you have a table that allows you to understand you know, what you should uh, prescribe to a, to a particular person? And what I've seen is if, if you even just put somebody on like one of these, it can be helpful. So anyways, I brought that up. It's Dragon Herbs, Ron Tea Garden. If you're, um, if you're a licensed practitioner, or even if you're just a health practitioner, um, if you tell them that and you order a big amount, you can get 40% off. They don't give it to you, just mention my name. Hopefully that'll help. And it's Ron Tea Garden's Dragon Herbs. Um, but it's also helpful because in this catalog, and like I said, I brought two of them here, um, it describes what these herbs are. And I mean, one idea is if you want to take these books and uh, buy them somewhere else, that's fine too. And I also brought, um, these are, as well as free, um, this guy Ron Tea Garden talks about the herbs and why they're important. And it's like a little bit of an, like an hour and a half education on Chinese medicine. And I find him very low key. So he's not like evangelizing, he's not pushing his product, he's just saying, okay, why is reishi mushrooms helpful? Why is it good? Um, you know, what, what does it do? What do you need to do? What, what is jing? That type of thing. So I just wanted to bring that up because it seemed like from last month there was a little bit of a confusion. So I wanted to just clarify that you can, you can figure this stuff out in like 10 minutes flat. So anyways, that's one. That's good. Any questions? Any questions or anything? I can. And there, no, I'm sorry. What so is I'm that just going to. Second book, Body and Soul. What is that, Body and Mind? Uh, this is one's it? Between Heaven and Earth, A Guide to Chinese Medicine. And it's by uh, Finefield and Cornwall. And I'll just leave them out so people can look at them. I find it uh, simpler than the webinars that we read. And it's for those people that want to sit down and read a book. This is more if you just want to have like 15 minutes and you want to just read a little bit when you have the time. So if you're on a short time scale. Thank you. By the way, I didn't mention, you probably noticed coming in the door, but I brought, I ordered uh, copies of Foster's book, which is self-published, which is, you know, again, it's a little bit off-putting. But uh, not that there aren't some good books out there that are self-published, but it is self-published. But the man just wants to, he's, he's like a lot of inventors I know, a lot of people. He's more interested in getting the work done than the marketing and the business side, he could care less. So he just charges on. He's written about 190 articles and books. And, and so he, he, uh, this book is self-published by some good people somewhere. It's at the top of the handout that I gave you. You can, you can uh, go on the web and get it for free, but it's a little bit tedious to download a you know, 170 page book if, and, and really work it. So I brought copies for 10 bucks. You can buy a copy, and uh, and I would recommend that you take a look at it if you have the time. It's a it's a it's a, it's a very uh, it's, it's actually fun to read because it's exciting. And uh, because hey, I, I'm not standing here and telling you that uh, this is the this, the solution to the problem. I'm just saying that I think it must be at least part of the truth. There's so much circumstantial evidence, and and the circumstantial evidence I've I, I've kind of giving you a glimpse of it in, in what I handed out there. So I'll stop there, but now I want to bring up, uh, let's see, um, did we decide, do we have people fighting over who's going to introduce Dr. Lester tonight? Uh, let's see, did, did, did Mike, Mike, uh, did you, you and Christine work that out? No, he can do it. Okay, okay, Mike will do it. Okay. Did you mention the uh, new, uh, next three meetings? Oh, go ahead, do that too. Okay, you know that uh, next month we're having Dr. Wang, the uh, expert on Vitalzyme, speak. And in June it's Gary Gordon. Spoke with two R's, they tell me. Is he, is he the, uh, uh, 
Uh, yeah, the chelation, Gary Gore. That's not the only thing. When you talk about the magnet things, he's investigating magnets that are the size of a room. And getting but he is that Gary Gordon. That's the Gary Gordon. Yeah, okay. The Dean Bonley guy that's working with Gary Gordon on magnets. And uh, he's into everything you can think of. Here. And in fact, he hasn't decided that. I had him narrow his talk down. And, and uh, pardon? June. June 17th, third Thursday, this room. And then in July, we were going to have two of the dentists that we heard at the uh, symposium in San Francisco that Dr. Cunion ran, who were doing the miraculous things described in uh, Rowan's newsletter about moving the bottom jaw forward, allowing more oxygen to go on. You gain a half inch in height instantly. And they had five patients there that were, had ill. Two of them had MS who were cured within a week of putting this in their mouth. One was an 11-year-old boy who was there. The lawyer for Rowan, uh, well, he didn't have the MS, but he couldn't sleep for 25 years until he put this device in. The next day, he slept uh, from then on. And they had uh, a man who had MS for 15 years, who got cured of that. And I forget who the other two. And the other one became, had fibromyalgia and my, uh, to the Lyme's disease, Jody, who is now his second, couldn't work, and is now his secretary in uh, Tacoma, Washington. Now, unfortunately, because of Rowan's newsletter, he's getting 100 calls a day. In fact, one of the calls was the 11-year-old boy's father read about it in the newsletter, brought his son up there. He had been in a wheelchair for the longest time, bent over and everything. When they put the device, he was showing movies. He got out of the wheelchair and started pushing it. And he was walking all over the place there. So he's gotten so busy from that, he can't come in, Ju in July. It will just be Dwight Jennings, who two or three of our people have already been seeing and are working on there. Dwight, can I just say something? You know, when you hear this, this sounds so completely crazy. It sounds like <laughs> nut, nut. But I heard this, this fellow uh, ropes to speak, and there's the mechanism. It, it, is, it finally starts to make sense. So I, I, I think there's, some, there's a lot to it. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not easily convinced about these things. So you know, I just wanted to, to make that, that kind of uh, caveat here, because otherwise you'd think we're really going off the deep end. But uh, come, and, come and hear the fellow, because you know, we don't put people on a program unless we think they can make a case. And then you know, we're, we're, not, we're not an easy audience. So, uh, so I, I recommend that you come and hear this fellow. Can we do a question, uh, Mike? Yes. Can you explain why it cost $10,000? I can't completely, except that uh, <clears throat> you got to keep coming back for adjustments. So that's a total price. And then he's got to change it you know, as the jaw moves forward. Now, part of the reason, and I don't know if he does what Dr. It's, it's, it's Rob. Uh, it's Jennings Rob. doesn't charge as much as Rob's in. Jennings, who will be our speaker, doesn't charge as much. Jennings Rob. also does something else. Thousand. Jennings does. Well, you know, they call it a splint. And Jennings will allow you to be split free, which Robson doesn't do. And I actually have two friends, one who had MS, and she went to him about three years ago, and she's now been symptom free for two years. And then I have another friend who used to get a cold every single week. She now gets a cold like every two or three months. Um, but I think she's paid a total of 4000 so he's a lower price, but they, they think it's because of the research and what they've learned that that's what they're paying for is all the time energy. But I know Robson charges a lot more money. And, uh, and that's for a extended period of time. I don't know the exact pricing, but it's... But Jennings is also, he's, uh, he's written about seven or eight articles, so he's published. And when he's done, he's, he's published his findings of where he's taking the people. It looks like these people worked independently, came up with the same idea. Oddly, they didn't even know each other. They were going to meet here on July 15th for Robson's schedule. He's also teaching dentists and doctors all over. So he just can't uh, commit to come here in uh, July, but Jennings will be here. Excuse and then in September, we're having my uh, question. Is, is there somewhere we can um, uh, go to find out a little bit of information in preparation for this? Sure. Mike Jennings, I think, has, if you look up that name, you'll get to his website, unless you know the exact one. And what's the name of the... 
Well, it, it's the, what, what I call it here is what actually Dr. Robert Rowan called it, correcting airway interference fields to cure diseases. What they're doing is allowing more oxygen to go down by pushing the jaw forward, which straightens the neck out, and we, we saw the x-rays. Rowan himself had it done and his wife, I forget. That was the, the last two. And it showed the x-rays of the neck when the, this appliance was put in, straightened out, and that's why he grew a half inch. Uh, instantly from that. And then when he takes it out, <laughs> it goes down again until some period of time of wearing it. So anyway, that's July 15th. Uh, we would have had him sooner, except we had Gordon and then Wong <coughs> already scheduled. And in September 16th, we're having Frank Schellenberger on energy medicine. And a few of you know about him. I don't know the details, but he's one of the, he was one of the most more outstanding speakers. There were quite a few at the conference in San Francisco. Anyway, tonight's speaker is Dr. Michael Lesser, who is a pioneering orthomolecular psychiatrist trained at Cornell University in New York City and the Albert Einstein Medical Center in the Bronx. Dr. Lesser, along with the late Linus Pauling, was one of the founders of the orthomolecular psychiatry movement, which focused on nutritional and vitamin therapy to regulate brain function. In 1975, he founded the Orthomolecular Medical Society and later Nutritional Medicine, a communications company that sponsors major world conferences on nutrition and vitamin therapy. He has testified before the U.S. Senate on Nutrition and Mental Health. He has published more than 50 peer-reviewed journal articles on the subject of orthomolecular psychiatry. And in his groundbreaking book, The Brain Chemistry Diet, which is there, he shows how identifying your brain chemistry type can help you conquer depression, reduce stress, and maximize your mind without prescription <coughs> drugs. Instead, the diet plan relies on a natural, safe, and effective nutritional approach to regulating mood and boosting brain power. He now practices in Berkeley, and um, the conference that he's putting on at the end of May, we're getting a special rate for our members of $150. The brochures are on the table describing the uh, speakers that will be there. We can go Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I think there's a doctor's day before that to the three-day conference. And I heard the last time he was in San Francisco, he had 1,100 people. We had 50 at Dr. Cunion's uh, conference. I don't know how you get 1,100 people, but I, is, was that right? That's what your son told me. We'll give you Dr. Lesser. Rick, he has some. One question, did anybody come here from seeing a notice in a newspaper? Hey, three. Ready? Wonderful. Any more? Four? Which what, what, what newspaper? Tell us a weekly. Tell us a weekly? Yes. Weekly? A uh, publicity. Good job. Okay, good work, David. Still can't get the mark to pay attention. But. Uh, okay. <clears throat> is the day before, and that's designed for anyone who really wants to know a lot about uh, neuropsychiatry, nutrition and neuropsychiatry. And that's a, that has a modest cost of its own. Uh, today, uh, we're talking about nutrition in the mind. And we're going to focus on three amino acids, which are, are really the latest thing, cutting edge, so to speak, in uh, psychiatry. Uh, nutrition in the mind. So, I want to thank uh, Christine Owens for this wonderful presentation that she's prepared. She's taken my disorganized uh, musings and put it into a very organized fashion here, as you can see. That's quite beautiful, too, I think. Uh, I think we can move along. The, the idea of this book, uh, The Brain Chemistry Diet, uh, it has a couple of ideas behind it. Uh, one idea is that uh, psychiatry today, as it exists, has got it all kind of wrong, as the rest of medicine does, of course. <coughs> Otherwise, why would we be here? Uh, 
I feel that we're fighting basically a Vietnam War, or maybe we should say an Iraqi War, in medicine today, uh, in that we see medicine and psychiatry as an enemy. I mean, disease is an enemy to us. And so we're fighting it like soldiers, trying our best to kill it. And uh, unfortunately, our success has been hampered by the fact that we kill ourselves in the process. Uh, we haven't learned how to destroy the disease and not the host in the same time. And this goes into psychiatry, of course, although it may be a little more subtle, but in our efforts to kill schizophrenia or uh, bipolar disorder, or whatever imaginary term we've made up and labeled the enemy, uh, we unfortunately, quite often, uh, by the bludgeoning techniques that we use, uh, destroy the host's uh, mind and all the potential, the, the tremendous potential that was there. So that's one of the reasons I wrote this book, was to try to bring a different emphasis to my field, because I believe psychiatry is, a, is an important field and a noble field, and it's certainly gotten a lot of attention. And so we might as well do it, I think, in a, in a fashion, if I may be so immodest, as to say that it will be beneficial to uh, its uh, recipients. And by this, I mean the first thing we have to do is change the terms in psychiatry. If you go into a psychiatrist's office today, the best thing you can come out of there with is the diagnosis without mental illness. Otherwise, you are labeled something that has a pejorative term to it. You might be called schizophrenic, or manic depressive, bipolar disorder, psychopathic, whatever. Uh, so, you know, depression, or maybe you're just anxious and neurotic, uh, like most of us. But isn't that strange where, you know, this is disease after all, neurosis is a disease, and yet Freud explains to us in kind of halfway talking, well, by the way, most of us are neurotic. This is actually what we consider normal. So there's something strange going on here. Uh, unfortunately, these uh, sometimes mythological concepts are referring to words like schizophrenia, which is basically, it's, it's a mythological, I shouldn't say mythological concept. Uh, Boyer, uh, a very good uh, German taxonomist, tried to understand these strange people that he was dealing with, and he came up with this term schizophrenia. But there's no pathological lesion supporting this, this word. It's strictly based upon four rather subjective assertions. Uh, words like autism, which is you as I understand you're all good scientists. You know that this, this is not really a, a word that can be easily defined. Autism, it can stretch the limits from uh, extreme withdrawal to something that is quite normal uh, in an individual at any given time. Uh, ambivalence. The four A's of Boyer, which defines schizophrenia in the beginning, are all subject to uh, complete uh, uh, subjectivity. Uh, the second A, ambivalence. Who is an ambivalent here? You know, I mean, are you going to vote for Bush, <laughs> <laughs> or are you going to vote for uh, Kerry? I mean, that's an ambivalent choice in the best of circumstances. Uh, then you've got the third A, uh, affect disturbance. Well, yes, I mean, you know, they talk about the schizophrenic having the inappropriate affect, you know, smiling and he should be crying, perhaps, uh, hearing of the news of the death or something. Uh, yes, of course, but then look at the beauty queens and how they cry and sob when they get their, when they get their prize and their crown. And so aren't we all sometimes quite inappropriate in our affect if we're just being viewed from the outside and nobody knows what's going on in our head at the time that we're feeling those emotions. And the fourth A is the so-called association defect. You know, when you talk to a person who's been labeled schizophrenic, you can't understand them. Uh, and so it's easy for the GP to say, well, they must be wacko. They're schizophrenic. I can't understand what they're saying. <coughs> Uh, they talk in a so-called word salad, it was one of the descriptions used in my training days. Uh, they, they refer to the whole person by maybe a, a part, you know, like 
skirt, so to say, they call a woman a skirt. Well, of course, that's slang today, isn't it? Or it used to be slang in the 50s. Anyway. Uh, but at any rate, it's again a very, very uh, totally subjective concept without any, uh, without a shred of proof for it, uh, as far as differentiating people in any way, scientifically, to be labeled schizophrenic. But once someone gets labeled schizophrenic, look at all the things that can happen to them. Uh, you know, Tom Zoss, of course, you may be aware of his writings on it, and how people have lost their civil liberties and so on behind diagnoses like this. And of course, it's had a tremendous effect on our whole California civilization. You know, Tom Zoss was the, uh, the crystal uh, intellectual figure behind uh, uh, Governor Reagan's decision to clean out the uh, mental hospital system that we used to have in the state because we were locking up these people against their will and taking away their civil rights. And so that's how the, the community mental health system was born. Uh, so you see how things can sometimes go haywire in an attempt to do good. Uh, we can actually do more harm. But let me get back to the, the next uh, on topic. So that's one of the ideas, is to change around the whole notion that uh, we're dealing with pathology here. Uh, because after all, if schizophrenia, whatever it is, if it was such a terrible thing, you know, a weak link. Why hasn't it died out? Why is it still around? In fact, more than ever. Same thing with bipolar disorder. Uh, why are these people who suffer so much, and have so much trouble, why are they still with us? According to, you know, theories of evolution, uh, they, should have, they should have disappeared a long time ago. Yet we still continue to have these, these uh, psychopaths amongst us, and, uh, so-called schizophrenics, psychotics is a big and better word, more honest word, and uh, so on and so on. And uh, I think it's because we've been looking at these problems as if they were problems. And we've been defining them in pathological terms instead of seeing that the cup is half full. Uh, schizophrenics, after all, change the world. Uh, they are the probably the, the greatest visionaries that we have. They're the most, they have the highest potential as human beings. So-called schizophrenics, I say. And when I say that, I give as my evidence, Sir Isaac Newton. He was a psychotic, lived alone all his life. He was very distinguished, but at the end of his life, he had a, a well-known psychotic brain. It's been diagnosed on and on. Martin Luther. Heard voices. Well, for that matter, you could go back into the Bible, and all practically all his prophets would be diagnosed schizophrenic, along with the Rabbi Jesus. You know, today. So I mean, but if we need if we need more modern evidence that there's something great in badness, uh, Vincent Van Gogh, uh, who's the example I describe in this book. Of, a, of what I call a dreamer, which is my positive name for this class of people who have been called schizoid or schizophrenic when they get in trouble. So Vincent Van Gogh, of course, was a typical schizophrenic and psychotic and actually killed himself. And uh, during his lifetime, he couldn't sell a single painting. His paintings were so different and bizarre. Not a single painting in his lifetime. And today, he is our most expensive pain. So this is what so-called schizophrenia can do to some people. Uh, now, the, the second type... So, do you uh, want to go through, like... Uh, well, through this order is very good. Yeah. yeah. What, what, but, uh, what, what we're going to do... The other, the other thing about... See, I divided the world into six types, and I know it's artificial because we're all really everything. But still, you will find that people do break out into these six types. Uh, and I know it's true scientifically because it's based upon uh, the whole history of psychiatry. I haven't, I haven't thrown the baby out with the bathwater. I've kept the whole history of psychiatry. I've just reversed our thinking about it so that we, 
instead of calling someone a schizoid, and then when he gets in trouble, he becomes schizophrenic, we call him a dreamer. And when he gets in trouble, he becomes schizophrenic. Uh, but we recognize that this is really potentially the best, uh, the, the cream of the crop that we have. Uh, and in fact, if you talk to schizophrenics, if they come into your office, you'll find that before they had their nervous breakdown, they were the straight A students, they were model citizens, they were well on their way to, you know, creating a, a great future for themselves. Uh, but we can go into that in detail later. Now the second thing that I try to do in this book is to begin to develop a differentiated treatment approach for these six different types. So there's a differentiated treatment approach for the schizophrenics and for the manic depressives, which I call the uh, stars. Because the bipolars, the stars, they're the movers and shakers of the world. Uh, they're the captains of industry. I remember Charlie Blue Dorn, who was a tremendous manic depressive. He was the president of Gulf and Western Industries. And uh, he just ran in a raid at his, uh, at his stockholders meeting like a true manic depressive in a manic state. He was terribly charismatic, carried everybody before him. And they are the people that do this sort of thing. Winston Churchill's the example I use in my book because he was such an excellent example of a manic depressive when he was in his manic phases. Of course, he was able to rally the whole Western world and put different people like Stalin and, and Roosevelt together in a grand alliance. And, uh, and also he could make some terrible mistakes when he was in his manic phases. Asthmatics are notorious, but they have very bad judgment. <coughs> yes? What kind of way were you with Stalin? Excuse me? Stalin? Stalin, yes. No. Stalin, I guess, would be a warrior, wouldn't he? I haven't really thought about him before, but I mean, that's just my first thought, because he was such a, uh, a, a Machiavellian type individual. The warriors have a, a very strong religious, uh, they're, they're the second most religious group. The dreamers are the most religious. Well, maybe the stars are the second, but the, the warriors and the stars, well, those three are the, are the religious groups, more so than the others. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do that in my uh, lesser way. The Stoics are the majority of people. Uh, the Stoics are the salt of the earth people. Uh, they're your chronic depressors. But the reason I'm trying to, I'm also trying to apologize to you scientists by saying that it's important that we divide these six different types because treatment's going to be a little bit different. And there's different things we need to look for if we're going to put this on a sound, sound biochemical footing. So that's my reason for having six different types, not just to try to sell books. Which one are you? Uh, I would call myself humbly a star. <laughs> and I, I, have moon, I have moon swings, and uh, I cycle up and down. Uh, but fortunately, I'm with relatively long cycles. And because of what I've learned about nutrition, I've been able to prevent myself from going off the deep end either way. Thank God, and so forth. Uh, but uh, the Stoics, as I say, are the most common type, maybe 50% of the people that come into my office, and they're the salt of the earth type people. They're the kind of people that you want to have as your secretary or whatever, because if you give them a job, they'll get it done. They don't complain about it. And, and they never uh, give you a hard time. And that's what their problem is, because they get depressed, you know, as you can imagine, because they never, they just try to grin and bear it and shoulder every everything, and sometimes they get depressed. And my example in the book is uh, <coughs> that wonderful president of ours, Abraham Lincoln, who had chronic depression and suffered from it. And he certainly was a stoic. I mean, you just look at him. There's a picture of a stoic individual. Uh, and he, he tried to, sh you know, carry the burden for all of us at that time. And he had, of course, as you know, many, many losses. He lost his mother when he was like 11 years old. And he lost his, uh, his sister, and he lost two of his children. And he lost his girlfriend. And the, the, the 
true love of his life, so to speak. And so uh, he had a, a tragic life. He eventually lost it. You know. But uh, he was a stoic, a good example of that, and that he had a number of depressions uh, in which he was very severely depressed. And he, like a true stoic, he said, when you're depressed and down, uh, work is a cure. I mean, that's a stoic attitude. The other thing he said was that the best thing that, that I can hope for is the good opinion of my fellow man. That's another stoic attitude. They live for the good opinion of other people, not necessarily for their own happiness. I mean, you wouldn't hear a warrior saying that kind of thing. Uh, you know, a warrior is more concerned with his own happiness or her own happiness, and as a result of that, they don't suffer from depression except very rarely because they they don't uh, put themselves in a position where they're going to get depressed. On a psychodynamic basis, depression is an anger turned in with us. Of course, <coughs> Dr. Knight, we're going to talk mostly about biochemical things, but that doesn't mean that they didn't have a psychological cause. It's just that we've decided that everybody isn't a genius, Sigmund Freud, and even Sigmund Freud said talk therapy isn't that good. So that the quickest way to cure most problems of the mind Appear to be chemical. Uh, so, you know, even if you had a psychological hurt or injury that caused your depression, we're going to talk about the chemical, uh, non dangerous cures for that sort of thing tonight. But getting back to our types, we know that depression is the problem with the Stoics, and so we're specifically going to look for a particular test, the serotonin test in the bloodstream. We're going to, this book describes the various uh, laboratory markers uh, that are helpful in, in these different types. <coughs> so with depression, you want to look at several things, uh, but uh, most importantly, serotonin. Because serotonin will give you an objective uh, measurement as to whether or not this person is depressed. Many depressed people aren't even aware that they're depressed, or if they are aware that they're depressed, <coughs> are doing their best to hide it from you and themselves. And so it's often a shock to me to measure serotonin on people like this who have so-called smiling depression and find that they're very low or absent. Uh, and then I realize, yes, I'm dealing with a smiling depression here. Uh, and often those who cry the most don't have an abnormal serotonin and they have more of a, you know, depressive reaction, but you know you're not dealing with a serious, severe biochemical upset uh, if the serotonin is, comes back normal. Now the other tests that you would test for in a, in a person who's depressed, severely depressed, if you were just going to do blood testing, would, that I test for at least, uh, would be uh, the zinc and copper level. Any kind of stress situation, you're going to throw the copper up and lower the zinc. Blood. So, uh, stress itself may cause us in copper imbalance, but also our current situation on the planet is tending toward us in copper imbalance since we get very little zinc, only borderline amounts of zinc in our diet today because of the widespread use of commercial farming, which replaces only three or four of the nutrients, you know, potassium and nitrogen, potash, and uh, doesn't pay much attention to the other 30 or so nutrients that are in the soil. So they're eventually being farmed out like selenium we were talking about earlier. Well, that can be a problem. California is a relatively selenium deficient state. And it's been related to depression too. Dr. Foster, who I have met, and I'm very impressed with, has commented on that too. That areas of selenium deficiency have more depression. And it's been touted as a, as a treatment for depression. <coughs> and it may be helpful. I've used 200 micrograms. But uh, getting back to the, uh, the types just to get through them, uh, and of course mention the other test that's very important in working up depression, and that's histamine. Uh, so there's those three things you want to check. Zinc and copper. You'll see a high copper, low zinc, if that's the significant problem that's, that's causing the depressive depression. 
and you'll see uh, a high histamine if that's the cause of depression, and you'll see a low serotonin if that's the cause of depression. On the other hand, if we move to the star category, the bipolar, so to speak, when they get in trouble, uh, if they're manic, their serotonin, where is their serotonin going to be if they're manic? Yes, very, very high, absolutely. And it works out that way. And if they're depressed, of course, it will be very low. Uh, on the other hand, what about cortisol? Plasma cortisol, you can measure that too if you want to. It's very interesting in men's depression. It was the first thing I learned about manic depression. I had this, when I was a medical student, I did a plasma cortisol on a manic patient. It came back seven. And then a couple of days later, he flipped very rapidly into a severe depression. And his cortisol was 41 or something. It was very higher than if he had an adrenal tumor. And so that really impressed me with how much hormones can play a role. And of course, we all know that emotions and hormones and how much they're tied together. That's why I'm so leery about using hormones so widely as they're being used today. Aside from their physiological effects is the tremendous effects that they have on the brain and the mind. Um, so the, the, so in, the, in the dreamer type, we, we might check cortisol too and, and, uh, and see, but still we can tell from the serotonin. With the lovers, we're dealing with one of the uh, so-called neurotic types. The stars and the dreamers are the psychotic types. They become psychotic when they get in trouble. But now the lovers, my example in the book is Marilyn Monroe, and her life is a typical life of a, of a lover. Uh, a person who, who relationships are very important to. Uh, really, their whole personality is centered on their relationships. Uh, now, a dreamer, he doesn't much care. He's a failure of relationships anyway. And relationships aren't very important to him, except his relationship to a higher power. But uh, lovers, they're very dependent upon relationships. Marilyn Monroe would sometimes pick up the taxi driver when she was going home because she just couldn't stand to be alone at night. And she always had to have something to get to sleep. And if it wasn't a man, it would be a bottle of pills. And she took a pill in the morning, and took a pill at night. It was a relationship thing. And it comes from you know extreme insecurity, of course, growing up with no relationships to speak of, you know, or very tenuous relationships. Her mother was a psychotic who spent most of her time in the mental hospital from when she was seven years old. And she never knew her father. Uh, he walked out before she was born. She tried to call him once, even after she became a big star. He, he kind of he said, would you like to talk to my lawyer? <laughs> that was his response to his daughter. So this is what happened with her. And this is very typical of a lover, the basic insecurity and the dependency problems. And the anxiety, of course, that goes with this neurosis uh, makes us think about catecholamine and the dopamine side of the nervous system. So of course, there we would want to measure the catecholamines to see if, if the person is, has got too high of a dopamine and uh, uh, epinephrine uh, levels, and maybe too low norepinephrine, which is you know, the beneficial one of the brain. Not the one that makes you feel nervous, but the one that makes you feel really good. Uh, and we can adjust those to some extent with nutrients, although I'm still learning about that. But I have noticed that vitamin C will tend to reduce uh, high catecholamines in large doses. Uh, then the, the, the next type would be uh, the guardians. The guardians are, are uh, what we call obsessive compulsive disorders when they get in trouble. And the example I use in this book is Leonardo da Vinci, a great painter, who uh, the other painter besides Van Gogh painted the Mona Lisa. Uh, 
Leonardo da Vinci was a tremendously prolific artist as a, a younger man. But as he got older, his, his obsessive compulsive condition made him more and more of a perfectionist and more and more distractible, both the problems that the OCD person suffers from. And as a result of that, he produced less and less work. And, and the Mona Lisa, which was his, you know, considered the greatest work of art ever produced at the time, is just a small painting, only about like so, if you've had the good fortune like I have to see it in the Louvre. Louvre. If I had the other fortune to go up in South Dakota, so I didn't ever learn how to pronounce it in French. <laughs> <laughs> Even our capital is Pierre. <laughs> Everybody else might think it would be called Pierre, South Dakota, but we call it Pierre. So at any rate, the Louvre, where the Mona Lisa is, it's only a small painting, and it took him four years to, to produce it. Uh, a full-time work, spent over four years of it. He didn't want to release it even then. He was felt it was not completed. But he finally reluctantly parted with it. But that's the problem with the OCD. And they live in a very uh, guarded world. That's why we call them guardians. They're constantly concerned and worried. Worry is a big part of their life. They're trying to protect themselves and their loved ones from any eventuality, that anything that might go wrong. And so they, they're the kind of people that are very well prepared and have their uh, garage stockpiled for any disaster and that sort of thing. But you know, Woody Allen you might think of as, a, as an example in a popular lifestyle of that type, the Guardian. They always think about death. I mean, they're obsessed with death, of course, because it's a control issue with them. And they want to be in control, and of course, nobody can control death, can they? So that's a problem with them. Uh, the, uh, and of course, OCD problems are a problem, aren't they? And, and, and how do we treat them? And what do we look for? Well, we look for serotonin again. Serotonin diet and all those things are players in the chemistry. So how do you how do you clean somebody else to make a diagnosis to figure out what you're going to do and cure them? Well, uh, all I do is I measure the zinc and the copper, I measure the uh, serotonin, I measure the histamine. <coughs> of course I go all the usual profiles because there's a lot you can tell about a person from the usual profiles too. But as far as levels of toxicity and cleaning them out, yeah, no white sugar, no white flour, no white rice, no stimulants. No caffeine, no alcohol. That's pretty much standard operating protocol for, for most patients who come to see you with severe depressive disorder or if they're psychotic. Because all those things do mess up their, their biochemical equilibrium. At the same time, you put them on all the nutrients in mega doses to overcome the shortages that have developed over 20 or 30 years of the eating junk food. And it's a general truism that the, the sicker a person is mentally, the worse their diet is. You know, that's why the so-called schizophrenics will, will be living on junk food. They're just like the innocents. You know, they eat what's good, and they eat what tastes good. But they don't have any consciousness. Or they, or they don't pay much attention to you know, health sort of considerations. So what do you define as malnour malnourished? As back to curiosity, you used that term earlier. What do you call malnourished? Uh, well, what do you mean? I mean, I call malnourished. If somebody's got a problem, my viewpoint is that there's malnourished. I mean, because I'm a nutritionist. So, I mean, right, Bob? Aren't we? We're sort of nutritionists here. We, we weren't educated as nutritionists, but we've come to it from our experience. So I, when somebody comes in and they're depressed, I figure they're malnourished. Because if they weren't malnourished, they wouldn't be depressed. I have never seen a person commit suicide who was in a sober state of mind. They only commit suicide when their brain is altered. One man took an overdose of heroin and committed suicide. One man drank a fifth of vodka and blew out his brain. I don't see people when they're sober. They may feel terrible, but they won't be that impulsive. They don't lose those inhibitions. Unless they're drinking or you know, doing something to their chemistry to alter it. 
Yeah. Um, you know, Lance Pauling and, and uh, Derek Hopper cooked up the term orthomolecular psychiatry because they got interested in B vitamins and schizophrenia, as I understand it. That's, that was part of their interest in it. I was just wondering what you thought of that theory of schizophrenia. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean I'm very interested in schizophrenia because uh, that's why I became a psychiatrist. I had a brother who was a shell shock victim of World War II. He lied about his age and he enlisted when he was 17. And he was in the Navy and he was out on an island and there was an explosion and everybody was presumed was killed with him. But, but he was always a little bit strange. He was brilliant too, but that sort of pushed him over the edge. And so I, I, had, I was a kid and he was like, a, you know, I, I would look at him as a teenager and that's how I got interested in the whole field. Uh, there's two theories of schizophrenia that I find appealing in this biochemical world that we're, that we're interested in. Of course, I like Tom Zoss. I talked about him before. <coughs> the so, his social ideas, I think, are very revealing. And uh, R.D. Lane, if some of you are familiar with him, he's also a very interesting writer in that whole field of psychosis and schizophrenia. But they don't understand the biochemistry. They're, they're sociological theories. And, and they fall a little short in explaining it, I think, because they don't see the bi biological side of things. And on the biochemical side, I think that there's two great men as far as schizophrenia, and that's Abram Hoffer, and of course his sidekick, who just died, Humphrey Osmond. And the other great, great figure is uh, Carl C. Feit. And they both were, and Hoffer, of course, still is, pretty successful in treating psychosis biochemically. And they use a little bit different approaches. I mean, we're probably treating different syndromes. In fact, Pfeiffer used to talk about the schizophrenia. Schizophrenia. He used to refer to them as the schizophrenia as being a dominion. And he defined the, the histidelic and the histopenic type schizophrenia. Well, actually, these words wind up being true to, for everybody, not just for schizophrenia. You know, you don't have to be histidelic. You don't have to be schizophrenic to be histidelic. So you can do the blood histamine test on everybody. Uh, at first I just did it on schizophrenics, but now I do it on everybody. Because if they're high histamine, they're going to be depressed. And if they're low histamine, they tend to be more manic and euphoric and that sort of thing. So again, it's a, something that helps you. And why does it help you? Because you can change it. If they're high histamine, you can bring the histamine down and get a change in the way the person feels. Now, how do you bring a high histamine down? Lithium, which is a classical treatment. And you don't have to use the high dosages that the, the traditional psychiatrists use. Uh, you can use a relatively low dosage. What do you think about lithium orotate? Yeah, lithium orotate and those those work, uh, Dr. Ebnathur, but they, they uh, <coughs> have to give them pretty high dosages. With, with people that are very sick uh, to get an effect, I've noticed. Uh -huh. Like about, oh, maybe 10 pills a day, you know, 50 milligrams or up in that range, you know, <coughs> certainly not one or two because it's, you know, it's more subtle. Yeah. They have, they have homeopathic lithium. I saw at the health food store. I was kind of surprised. It's from a, <clears throat> probably for health professionals only, but this particular story had Does that work? Or have you had any experience with homeopathic lithium? I haven't had any experience with it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm certain that it, that, it, that it does something. I know homeopathy is a very powerful tool, but I just don't know how it would affect histamine. Uh, the other things that will lower a high histamine are calcium, a gram a day of calcium, and uh, uh, the other one is uh, methionine, D-L-methionine, uh, and again, a gram a day, 500 milligrams twice a day of both. Yeah, have you heard, uh, there's a Dr. Uh, Botman Gellich who wrote a book called Your Body's Many Cries for Water. And in there he states that <clears throat> most people are dehydrated and that the less water in the system, the greater the rise in histamines. And that he was able with his patients to normalize histamine levels by getting them to drink wow. a couple of quarts of water per day. You know, I think there might be something to that because I, I've noticed it with myself even. When I drink more water, I just seem to be less, you know, less mucousy. And, yeah, what he calls histamines, one of their, one definition he said is the, they're the drop managers of the body. And when we're losing moisture through breathing out, there's not enough water in our system, 
Histamines go to work to shut down the alveoli in the lungs, creating a mucus block so that you're not going to lose as much water. And when people start drinking, all of a sudden their uh, breathing improves and their, their lungs open up again. So time and again, he's got, it's a great book. You can go on the, uh, go on the web, it's called watercure.com and see some of his papers there. And uh, check it out. I wonder research. if that would be if helpful in conditions like cystic fibrosis where you have a I think he mentions that in there, as a matter of fact, because you do get clogged up lungs. Right. <coughs> well, so, and, and on the other hand, if the histamine is low, and you have an individual who's like just too spacey and, you know, living on another planet, and you want to get that histamine up so that they can be more sober and realistic, then you use niacin and folic acid and vitamin B12. Those three B vitamins will all raise histamine. And you should be aware of that too if you have like a histamine reaction when you're sort of taking a lot of niacin and lower your cholesterol. So. Uh, how much niacin do you recommend that an average person takes per day? Well, I don't really have a recommendation <coughs> for average people because, you know, who's the average? That's <laughs> I mean, it's quite varied. I mean, you know, uh, you only need 20 milligrams a day to uh, keep from getting pellagra. But um, three grams a day is the treatment uh, of choice to uh, lower cholesterol. And uh, in treating uh, schizophrenia, Hoffer uses as much as eight grams a day. The two basic theories then, Hoffer, of course, was the originator in 1952, I think, of the whole idea of using niacin and vitamin C and mega doses, three grams each, with a high protein diet, uh, sugar free diet to treat schizophrenia. And Pfeiffer uh, uh, found that uh, the high dosage niacin was good for the low histamine schizophrenics, but the high histamine schizophrenics didn't do well on that. And he usually limited them to less than a gram or a gram a day of niacin. He also discovered what he called uh, pyroluria. Uh, you know, there's a test for pyroluria, cryptopyrol in the urine. It all sounds a little bit like Superman. <laughs> but uh, you can get this test done uh, at Hugh Reardon Center out in Wichita, Kansas, uh, and probably other places, although I don't think you can get it done through the usual standard laboratories. It has to be a send out. Why you would want to do the test, at one time it was thought to be diagnostic for a type of schizophrenia a syndrome that was called pyroluria, uh, in which Pfeiffer had described as occurring in people who have a China doll complexion, you know, blondes, blue eyes, and uh, uh, they usually had a very good present, they were more of a hysterical schizophrenic, they were a good present good presenting focus and all that. Uh, but uh, I have found that the cryptopyrrole test is only specific for hypoglycemia probably. Maybe Dr. Ebnather wants to comment on that, but I see it in about 30, 40% of the population. So I don't find it helpful as a diagnostic tool, but, but maybe that's just me. At any rate, he did define this one group and this group is benefited by uh, zinc and vitamin B6 in large amounts. They're also notorious in that they have white spots on their fingernails as a, a symptom of zinc deficiency. And uh, then, of course, Pfeiffer is responsible for the copper zinc business, too. And he showed that copper toxicity can cause a type of psychosis uh, that's associated with a racing mind difficult to sleep in, and severe depression, all from copper toxicity. Mm. And taking people off copper and giving them a lot of zinc, uh, he was able to reverse those kinds of problems. So that's kind of where we are at with, with the psychosis and severe mental illness as far as our understanding of biochemistry today. And it, yes? Where do uh, people with panic attacks fit into the scheme? Well, you know, we were just—I was just going to talk about GABA because we talked about L-tryptophan and how that's good if you're depressed. 
and uh, the panicky people uh, were thinking GABA these days. What is GABA? GABA is the main uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter of the brain. And you know, you've got your stimulating and your inhibitory mm -hmm. neurotransmitters. It's just the same thing as the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems. You've got these, these two different kinds of neurotransmitters working in your brain, one stimulating you and one inhibiting you. And GABA is the main inhibitory one. It's the one that calms down your brain when it's over racing and so much going on you can't even think of what the next thing to do is because there's so much going on in your brain. So the GABA calms everything down, gets the chatter down, and then you can say, oh yeah, now I should be doing this. Yeah. So it's very important. And it takes the place like Valium. You know, we used to use Valium. Now you can just give people GABA. Or if you want to use a prescriptive form so that their insurance will pay for it, there's Neurot, which is GABA pen. Yes? You have to mention DL phenylalanine, which seems to be most of the same thing to the L-tyrosine. Uh, but it's, I think, one of the closer to the formation of catecholamines. Is there a reason you use tyrosine versus DLPA? Well, yes. Uh, I use uh, DLPA if I'm treating a case of migraine, migraine headaches, uh, because it's very, very effective for that. It seems to have a pain-killing quality to it. And then I give, like, three tablets a day, 500 milligrams, three times a day, for a week to load them up on and then uh, the migraine sufferer, I give them just a maintenance of one tablet of 500 milligrams DLPA a day from then on. If it's a woman, I put her on a, they usually have PMS, bad PMS with them. And so then I put them on a high protein, hyperglycemic diet, you know, and frequent feeding to help with the PMS as well as the migraine. And in two or three months, they don't have a migraine problem. You can also use L-tryptophan for migraines, too, because, again, it's raised to low serotonin. Yes, sir? How much GABA do you use? GABA? I use, uh, well, with someone who has uh, anxiety, you know, 500 milligrams twice a day might be enough. But if it's severe, you can go up to 500 milligrams. Uh, you can give them four grams a day. You can give them eight tablets a day with safety. They might get a headache. If they get a headache, they, you know, a few people will complain of a headache at that level. The other side effect from GABA is just that it, it wastes some because it's supposed to relax you, so it can really tire you and knock you out if you take too much of it. But you can use it as a sleeper as well to help you calm down and go to sleep. Yes? versus Right. Well, uh, because I just haven't used much melatonin, you know, I don't know if it works or not. Uh, it, yeah, it's, people tell me it works for sleep. I, as again, it's a hormone. I'm a little bit dirty of hormones. Uh, just because it's one notch up in the control level, you know. But uh, no, I have nothing against melatonin. I just don't use it. I don't need to use it much because L-tryptophan is, is so effective for, for sleep disturbances. So. How, does, how does processed sugar affect the whole chemistry for probably different symptoms? Well, I mean, just talk about insomnia. You know, the first thing you've got to do with somebody who's got insomnia is tell them to stop eating sugar because that will keep you awake at night because the magnesium deficiencies that go along with that. And, uh, what, was the, what was your question? How does, how does processed sugar fit into all these different symptoms of people with the right mental illnesses? That's it. As I said, the person with the best diet has the best mental health, and the person who's eating the most sugar is going to be neurotic and crazy. I mean, I, it, Why is that? <clears throat> because it's a it's not a it's not a food. It's a, it's a part food. You're getting the sugar. You're getting the calories, but you're not getting the magnesium and the manganese and the zinc and the vitamins, the B vitamins, and all those things, the chromium, that are in the, the molasses syrup that are lost in the refined sugar. Is that covered in the book? Yes, all that's covered in the book. All these theories are covered in the book. Everything is covered in the book. <laughs> <laughs> the whole, 
Yes. I have a question. About 30 years ago, I was, I was working with a psychiatrist friend of mine. He loved schizophrenics. We had a, a conference for about five weeks, and all schizophrenics were invited. And these are people that saw visions, they heard voices, they saw auras, the whole works. And he was explaining, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, he said that serotonin is a compound comprised of harmine, which causes auditory hallucinations, bufotamine found on the skin of toads, that's the old licking the toad trip for the psychedelic nature of things, and then um, 5 methoxy uh, tryptamine, I believe it is, or, D or DMT, you know, which is a real powerful psychedelic, and that people that were diagnosed with schizophrenic and hospitalized, these would break down and they'd hear voices. It's, and then this niacin, I had heard, then stabilized that back into its normal trans neurotransmitter compound, and then these symptoms seemed to go away. Have you heard anything to that effect? Well, I've noticed it, because I, when I do the lab tests, I've noticed that, that people with the so-called schizophrenic syndromes don't fall into a neat category with serotonin. Uh -huh. They may have a high serotonin, they may have a low serotonin, maybe normal. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't help. And I suspect that's because we're dealing with a lot of different syndromes. Does it, does ni niacin normalize the serotonin levels? Or how, how would you? Uh, niacin will raise serotonin levels. Raise serotonin levels. Yeah, it will help to raise serotonin levels. Oh, OK, great. Uh, because I haven't found 5-HTP to be particularly helpful in my practice. I tried it. I tried it for a while there when, when L-tryptophan wasn't available. And, uh, but I've talked to some patients who have been helped by 5-HTP. It just depends on the individual. But for most of my patients, I just, I'm comfortable with L-tryptophan. <coughs> I know that the stuff is good, and uh, I know how much to use it, and I have a lot of experience with it. Yeah. Yes. So glad you mentioned that. I wish I knew, but you ask about idiosyncratic reactions. I just had this happen. What kind of idiosyncratic? Yeah, I just had a patient who I gave L tryptophan for, and he couldn't sleep at all. Yeah. It had a completely opposite reaction to him. It made him completely unable to sleep. I, but I don't know why yet. Oh, I, if I ever will know. Yeah. I've found that I was taking six, about six grams of hydrogen a day, and uh, I ended up starting to get hives from that and five HDs where I just stopped taking anymore. Have you seen that happen with other people? Do you know why it's happening? Again, I don't know why it's happening, but I've heard I've heard that from one of my patients also just recently. Cold sores in the mouth. Um, taking L tryptophan. Or they, they're not sure if it's L-tryptophan. It, it may be that the kid eats a lot of sugar, too. Oh, good. Yeah. The case of Sarah? Well, Sarah was a, a depressed woman. Well, we have slides on it. Do you have slides on it? Yeah. Sarah was a, a lovely young woman who was newly married. She'd been married about a year and a half, two years, and uh, she had a you know a nice husband. He came to her parents, came down from the north, and uh, uh, she couldn't bring a, uh, a pregnancy to completion, and she was very depressed. Of course, she came to see me about depression. Uh, but uh, being a young doctor at the time, relatively young, I didn't know what to do for her, so I gave her everything, in my, which was my way of doing things, just to give everybody everything, a shotgun approach, so to speak. Because I found out that these nutrients are safe, and they don't have any side effects. So why wouldn't you give them everything? In fact, you run a risk if you give them just some, and not the others, that you'll create deficiencies because they're getting a lot of this one thing and they're not getting enough of this other thing. So I gave everybody everything, <coughs> assuming that I didn't know everything and that maybe it was there. <laughs> At any rate, what happened with her was, well, she had severe hypoglycemia and low blood sugar. In those days, I did five-hour glucose tolerance tests on every patient who came to see me. And I accumulated about 600 of those tests. And I found that 67% of the patients had hypoglycemia. So uh, there, there was a real connection there in my mind between blood sugar problems 
and emotional illness. Uh, she had low coppers, which can result in fatigue and fertility, as that says. But in her case, I think that the thing is, because she had a successful outcome, her depression was corrected, and more importantly, uh, she was able to get pregnant and deliver to full term. And I think that what, what resulted in her successful pregnancies, and she had four of them, by the way, uh, so she has four children today, was that she got vitamin E in the natural form, you know, the mix of Tom balls, and she got the natural form of vitamin A, the fish liver oil, and she got the large doses of folic acid, which we all know are so important, uh, you know, for, for women's uh, reproduction for some reason. But the thing that she got from me that I didn't even know might have helped her, but I discovered later a cause, because you can have you can have miscarriages from lack of vitamin E and lack of folic acid. And also, does anybody know what other nutrient is associated with miscarriages? Vitamin C. You're right, vitamin C, but what part of vitamin C? Exactly, the bioflavonoids, which Albert Sven Georg discovered. He also discovered vitamin C, he discovered the bioflavonoids, and he felt that they were very important. Although they can tend to get neglected, and most of the people who sell vitamin C, they don't even put any bioflavonoids in there. So a lot of people are maybe are getting bioflavonoid deficient from taking massive doses of ascorbic acid without bioflavonoids. At any rate, that may have been what caused her to have successful pregnancies, because I do remember that I gave her, I mean, I wrote it down on her prescription regimen of bioflavonoids. Too. But all for 10 grams of C? Oh, I didn't give her anything like 10 grams, I don't think. Did I? Did it say that up there? No, but that's... Uh, I think I gave about, you know, 3 grams. Is the usual, usually what I gave to the average person who was depressed. Although sometimes I would give as much as 10 grams. That's a thunder claim, he would, he would make sure that all pregnant patients had 10 grams of C and he never had any pregnancy and delivery problems or infant health. You know, I had an interesting case recently with regard to that. Another woman who was depressed but also uh, got pregnant while she was working with me. She had a relationship and got pregnant. Not for you. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore, buddy. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so you used to do that, all right? <laughs> <laughs> I know I got one. And where were you tonight? I think I got one woman pregnant, but I'm not sure. You, know, you never really know for sure, right? <laughs> Although they do bear resemblance. Uh, but anyway, in this case, uh, she, uh, I got, I had her on a lot of vitamins. She was on a lot of mega vitamins, and I, and I probably made a mistake here because when she got pregnant. I got scared, and I thought, well, gee, maybe we better take her off these vitamins, these mega doses. Maybe it'll make some problem here. You know, I just didn't want to mess with it. And she lost that pregnancy. I often wondered if, if I kept her on the high doses of vitamins, if she would have kept the pregnancy. Does anybody have any experience with that kind of a problem? Yeah, well, Thunder's thing was three grams of first trimester, six grams second trimester, and 10 grams the third trimester. <clears throat> there was some fake Russian study that said that vitamin C caused abortions, but their, their criteria was ridiculous. It was a woman who had missed a period or something and then had a period when they were put on vitamin C, and they called that an abortion. It was ridiculous, and Linus Pauly commented on that study. But no, we haven't found that vitamin C ever does anything bad to a child. And quite frequently, when they deliver, we have them put sodium ascorbate on their nipples, and that keeps them from getting chapped, and it gives the kid a lot of vitamin C. Besides that, it's coming through with the breast milk. And I've heard that if the mother is taking a lot of vitamin C, that, that the child will be uh, dependent on vitamin C and should be given uh, vitamin C too. And, or, or the mother should be continued, I guess, if she's breastfeeding. Well, what I can't prove that, but that's why I do it, just to be ready. But what if she's not breastfeeding? Uh, what if it's a bottle baby? I really had that problem, but I mean, I guess you could put a little pinch of sodium ascorbate in the formula. Kind of put a 
Dr. Like Cathcart a program for, for neonates. Dr. Cathcart's going to be talking at our conference, by the way, in great detail about vitamin C. Yeah, what was the question? Dr. Clinton gave uh, a gram a day to neonates and then a gram uh, a day per age up to age 10. But you know, on this withdrawal scurvy, I'd like to point out that we are not an ascorbate producing animal. It's like, you know, you give thyroid to a person, it makes them make less thyroid themselves. But if you give them vitamin C, they're, they're not going to make less vitamin C. Now, theoretically, you might get more enzymes that break down vitamin C faster, but I don't find that that's very important. Usually what happens is that with adults, if they're taking large doses of C, they're doing it for some reason, like chronic fatigue or something really like that, and then they stop the C, their old problem comes back again. But you take a perfectly healthy person and give them large doses of vitamin C or what they won't be able to take large doses of ascorbic acid because they'll get diarrhea if they're perfectly healthy. Uh, but when they stop whatever they can take, I don't see any problem. Well, are there any other questions tonight? Yeah, thank you. I guess yeah. Michael, uh, could you say something about how you made the transition from mainstream <laughs> medicine to nutritional medicine? Well, I had the help of my brother who had had a nervous breakdown, mm -hmm. and it was a considered a chronic schizophrenic. He had all the usual treatments at that time, electroshock therapy, brain therapy, and all that. And uh, so that always kept me a little, you know, alienated from what I was learning in medical school and in my residency because I knew I had this brother who had the same problem that these patients had. And so I knew that there, there had to be some kind of an answer. You know? And so uh, I didn't want to give my brother these tranquilizers that were messing up these people that I was working with in the hospitals. And then uh, my oldest brother, Lawrence, who was kind of a dictator of our family. There's nine children, seven of the rock, two girls. He uh, sent me an article in the newspaper about uh, Abram Hoffer's treatment. So I tried to use that treatment when I was a resident in psychiatry at, at Albert Einstein. And I, because I, I had a case on the ward, and it was one of the, it was on thousands of milligrams of poison. And she just had been sick, terribly psychotic. And I was like her fourth doctor. She just wasn't leaving the hospital. And the family had asked me to give him this medical treatment. But the supervisor that I had said to me, well, that treatment has been studied and been disproven. It's a fake, it doesn't work. And I found out who had studied it later. It was Nathan Klein, who was the same gentleman who introduced Thorazine to the Western world. <laughs> and he studied it the way he would have studied a drug. I think in all sincerity. He just gave niacin patients. He didn't give them the high protein diet, limited carbohydrate, frequent feeding. He didn't give them a sugar free diet. He didn't give them the vitamin C in mega doses along with the niacin in mega doses. He gave them, I don't think he even gave them three grams of niacin. He gave them a relatively small amount of niacin for only four weeks and then stopped the study. <coughs> and, you know, said, so, well, we didn't show anything. And that became the nucleus for the APA task force report that condemned all the electric psychiatry and put us back so many years when that came out. Because we had an academy of working electric psychiatry. We had 300 attendees at the 1973 conference. The task force report came out in 1974, and there were 100 attendees at the conference that year. That's one of my questions is, could you give us a little bit of a thumbnail history of orthomolecular psychology? I'll tell you what, before you go on that, I'd like to find out what happened to your patient, brother. what happened to your brother. Yeah. And yeah. My brother uh, was a success story, in a way, in that uh, we found out eventually, he became Pfeiffer's patient, Carl Pfeiffer. And uh, it also brought in an interesting element, because uh, I had run into a girl uh, a beautiful woman <laughs> who was a friend of uh, my sister-in-law. 
she had come to a party of my sister-in-law, and when she heard who I was in the body, she was a patient of Pfeiffer's also. She had been psychotic. She had gone down to Mexico and thought she was the Virgin Mary and stripped herself naked. And uh, Pfeiffer had treated her and got her well. And I was just finding out about all this stuff. And then I met her at this party and I talked to her and, and I was very impressed with everything. And I was just finding out about all this stuff. And I had this brother back in South Dakota, you know, and my family was saying, come on, Mike, you can do it. <laughs> So I hired her, and I sent her back to Mitchell, South Dakota, and she moved in with my brother and my parents, and lived with them for three months. She got him to quit smoking. He was a chain smoker. All he did was smoke cigarettes, because, you know, in Fort Meade, they gave them to you by the carton of if you were a veteran. And he chain smoked cigarettes. She got him to quit smoking cigarettes, and he drank coffee. He swilled coffee all day long black coffee and cigarettes. That was his life. She got his quick coffee, and she got his quick smoking cigarettes. She was a recovered schizophrenic herself. So I believe in that concept of using linkers. If you can find people who have had the problem, they know the problem much better than anybody else does. And they can communicate to these people. So at any rate, he became a different person. Did he use niacin and vitamin C and stuff? He used niacin and vitamin C, but mostly B6 and zinc, and mostly it was just removing these poisons, detoxifying, if you will, the cigarettes and caffeine. And uh, what we discovered about him, and this is why I'm uh, concerned about hormone therapy, is uh, he kept coming out to visit me year after year. And I would do a physical on him and, and do a bunch of blood tests, and he kept coming back with low thyroids. So finally I said, well, gee, he's got high low thyroids. And of course that goes along with mental illness. And so I took him to a very good endocrinologist in San Francisco, who heard that he had hypothyroidism, and put him on Synthroid. But then he went back to South Dakota, and where he didn't get such good attention. And uh, I don't know if he took an overdose of the Synthroid or if it just was too much for him because he was an older man at this point. And he had a tachycardia, an emergency tachycardia, and a, he nearly died, but they were able to uh, stop the tachycardia. But then it happened a few years later, like a second time, and this time uh, he, his legs turned blue and, and they took him into the local hospital and he even did surgery on him. Mm -hmm. uh, and the doctor told me and later he said, you know, there was nothing there. There were no clots there. They thought there was a clot. But what they found is that he was severely hypothyroid and with severe hypothyroidism you get very severe arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So he had no circulation to speak of. But as a result of that he lost his leg uh, at the Mayo Clinic following that episode of uh, tachycardia. And a year later, he lost the other leg. And again, because they did a bypass. They did a bypass on the one leg. And of course, the doctor, surgeon told me, one of the head surgeons told me, he said, it's going to last about a year. That's about as long as it lasts. But they do a lot of surgery on the other <laughs> At any rate, I became alarmed when he had this hypothyroidism and severe atherosclerosis. And once I discovered that, I said, well, that's it for you. You're going on a strict vegetarian diet. And, and he had three glasses of freshly squeezed orange juice every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and a strict vegetarian diet. Well, it wasn't totally strict, but uh, basically no red meat. I think he was only allowed fish and eggs and a little dairy products. And uh, for five years he was fine. He had no cardiac, no circulatory problems. Then I lost a good woman who was taking care of him now in South Dakota because you know, here he was, double amputee, schizophrenic. And the schizophrenia was cured to this extent that not that he could ever be like a nine to five kind of guy. 
because I don't think that schizophrenics are, are cut out to be 9 to 5 type guys. But he could now work to some degree. He could have some help in the family business out there. And he was no longer disturbed. Before, he used to run out and screaming, sometimes in the middle of the day, he would scream certain things that probably had a lot of symbolism to him. But I haven't totally figured him out yet. But anyway, that, and he used to run away. All that behavior stopped. All the emotional upset stopped. The denial some treatment, and the B6, and the vitamins, and the dietary changes, and getting him off the stimulants. All that changed. He never lost the voices. He told me that. He says, I, you know, I never stopped hearing the voices. So I don't know what that means. Uh, but uh, some patients have lost voices just when they stop smoking cigarettes because they have an allergic reaction and they stop hearing voices. Uh, what about the woman, Albert Einstein, who didn't put in place? The woman who moved in and took care of her? No, Albert Einstein. Oh, she never got the treatment because, uh, you know, that you couldn't. You couldn't give a megabyte of therapy, you, you still can't today at any academic institution in the United States. Uh, yeah, that's just the way it is. Could you give us a little bit of the, the uh, early history of... But by the way, the, the sad story about my brother was that he did die after five years because I lost that good health that was giving him the fresh squeeze one years. And uh, the people that took care of him were ignorant about nutrition and we I mean, put him on Meals on Wheels because that was the only thing we could get. I said, well, what about Meals on Wheels, Simon? He said, it sure tastes good. <laughs> <laughs> so he had three months on that and he was very happy. He died. <coughs> when you uh, do these tests on people uh, and find that they have some deficiencies, do you allow them to get corrected in their diet first before you give them any additives, supplements? Well, no, because uh, for one thing, the blood testing for vitamins, I stopped doing that a long time ago because it wasn't helping me very much. Uh, <coughs> you know, they might have a normal blood level, what passes for normal, and still be benefited by an, an optimal amount of that. So I just go ahead right away and put them on all the nutrients. I get the blood testing to see if they've got a serotonin problem or if they've got a copper zinc problem. If they have a B12 deficiency or a folic acid deficiency, I'm going to spot that in their CBC because they'll have you know blood cells that are abnormal, that be abnormally large. So how long do you keep them on these uh, protocols? I keep them on the protocols until their chemistries are normal. And then it's up to them. If they want to stay on the maintenance, fine. If they don't, it's their life. Yeah. Do you have oh, books to practice? Do they all get sold? They're all gone? I have three more in the car, three or four more in the car. I can run and get those. I was thinking about the testosterone, which seems to be a big uh, depression. Testosterone. Do you have an official regime that, that brings the testosterone levels up? I'm going to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd like you to work on that. It works great. What? For the rest of us, we actually just take testosterone and it works great. Oh, but you know something? Uh, I was treated, working up at Napa State Hospital, and one of my patients was a guy who, who took a lot of testosterone. We're talking about human bioidentical testosterone, not drugs. Oh, okay. Well, maybe that's different. This guy wound up killing his girlfriend on testosterone. How does that relate to uh, prostate cancer? Does that create more of a problem for prostate cancer? Well, uh, I think it's testosterone. You know, I'm not an expert. I don't know. I would have think so. I would think so. I would think. Why would no? No. <laughs> no. Doctor disagrees with me. <laughs> Doctor can't. Yeah. What do you, do you know something about it? The, the work that I've been following it has by this fellow Shippen, who wrote this uh, testosterone uh, syndrome book. And uh, he treats andropause, and he's been giving testosterone to uh, andropausal men for 10 years, and he says he hasn't had any uh, 
prostate cancer from that group. And if you take a person who has a slightly elevated PSA, so far they haven't got the guts up to use it on prostate cancer, although I happen to know there's two molecular physicians who are doing this to themselves. Uh, but we don't dare for legal reasons do this to other people. Um, the, but it lowers the PSA. The thought is that testosterone causes differentiation of the prostate cells. Now it is true that prostate cells require a little testosterone to exist, sort of. But so, in, so if you do castration or Lupron, uh, there is shrinkage of the cancer in all the prostate cells. But after five, six, seven years, it escapes its dependency on testosterone and comes back. So, but anyway, that seems to be the, the thing: is that prostate needs a little bit of testosterone, but that testosterone in, in normal amounts causes differentiation of prostate cells, which is good. What's normal? Yeah, I think normal Mary. amounts. Normal amounts has got to be good, and that's why I, I say try to stay young as long as you can by being very careful with your diet, because when you carelessly go and start eating foods that aren't complete, you're going to guarantee that your testosterone levels are going to go down, and you know your everything is going to go down, and then you. How, how are you going to correct that problem? Are you going to correct it by taking these individual hormones and maybe messing it all up? Because it's a concert going on here. Or are you going to go back to the basics? I just think that the, the intelligent thing is just to go back to the basics. Do it the hard way. You know, make sure that everything that you eat is a real food. <coughs> yeah, but don't give testosterone to a young man. <laughs> Under any circumstances, it causes atrophy of the testes. Uh, you, you give it only to the men after they're lowering their testosterone. That, and that's another thing. You never see a 20, 30 year old man with cancer of the prostate. You get the old men where their testosterone is way down, that's when they get cancer of the prostate. Well, of course, the, the thing is, is that, you know, if, if a good doctor is prescribing something, it, there's never a problem, but it's patients get enthusiastic about these things and then they use them to excess, even nutrients, and that's when the problems occur. Could you give a little history of uh, lobotomy? Lobotomy? Yeah, lobotomy. The prefrontal lobotomy? They, yeah, lobotomy? they recommended that for my brother. He was he kept running away from the Fort Meade Hospital in Rapid City. And so they said, he's uncooperative. He should have the prefrontal lobotomy. <laughs> 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 so my father took him to the doctor in, in Boston who brought it into the country. And uh, I think his name was Walter Strange. But I mean, they did that. They did that lobotomy stuff. Yeah, they did it very, it was very widespread in the 50s. Still do In the 50s. Yeah, but it became discredited, fortunately. A couple of movies. But why were, why were they doing it? They were doing it to separate the emotional brain from the intellectual brain. So that these people who were very disturbed and upset, you know, were running away and uncooperative and yelling and screaming and upset, became calm. But uh, too many of them were turning into vegetables, and so they they just started the treatment. And this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, the Kennedy girl yeah. had a lobotomy. The one, the presence. That's another interesting thing about schizophrenia. And I'm going to write a book called "The Stoning of the Prophets," strictly about schizophrenia, because uh, they occur. And this is why I've been able to support myself, even though I treat psychotics, because they occur in prominent families uh, for some reason, which I have my own theories about. What, what, are, what are the long-term effects of uh, neurological damage to people that are on, uh, on pharmacological drugs? You know, the doctors give these, give these patients these drugs and they go on for years. It's got to have, it's gotta have a dis you know, Part of this could be 89% of patients put on tranquilizers will develop target dyskinesia. What is that? That's the shaking tremor. Uh, many people think that that's psychosis, but it's not. It's the reaction of the drugs that are given to the psychiatrist. There's nutritional treatment for that. There are many nutritional treatments for it. Uh, the, most of, the one that I found most effective is choline, uh, which was discovered by Leo Hollister right here at Stanford. Uh, 10 grams of choline chloride 
uh, a day to uh, people with tardive dyskinesia, severe shaking, tremors, you know, sometimes they get a serpentine like tongue darting in and out. And uh, grimacing, face grimacing, uh, repetitive face grimacing. And 10 grams of choline cured this one patient I had who had it in three days. Uh, other treatments that have been suggested are vitamin E, uh, essential fatty acids. Uh, Richard Cunyon uh, you know, suggests manganese. And I haven't seen tardivis. That's the other great thing about nutritional therapy. You don't see tardivis kinesia. I'm working with all psychotics, most of Well, not all psychotics. I'm getting a lot of the wrong stuff. <laughs> but uh, now that I'm getting more notorious, so. but the uh, you don't see tired dyskinesia. But I went and worked. I did eight weeks in the California State Prison last fall, uh, and uh, there I saw a lot of tardive dyskinesia. Did they let you use nutritional therapy there? No, they didn't. Strange thing. Why did you go? <laughs> what? Why did you go? Why did I go? I don't know. I just. Uh, you know, I worked in the prisons when I first <coughs> got on my university training. I went, I was with the federal prison. And I was, it was quiet. I'd been traveling a lot and I, there, was, there weren't any, nobody was calling me up. And I needed a few bucks. And these local tenants people keep calling you all the time. You know. they, they, they make it so, I felt sorry for the woman. <laughs> so I took the job. But it was not a bad experience, I will say. Of course, it's tough to be in prison. It was a level four prison. And, you know, all murders and all that. But it's just really, it's a very heart-wrenching story. So which, which major uh, hospitals in America are practicing as nutritional uh, therapy nurses? There aren't any. Really? Yes. No, there's yes. probably less than 10% of the medical schools are, are teaching anything about nutrition, even today. Even today. And, and the drug industry's got a hammer lock on uh, on psychiatry. Up at this prison I was working at, they had a machine up there that cost $250,000. It was like something out of Catch-22. We just kept spewing out the prescriptions for drugs. Yeah. You know, they had it all automated down. The whole prescription. It was incredible. And, the, and most of the patients there, you know, they're prisoners. They're in a mental institution, yes. They were, on, they were on the ward, the psych ward, but you know, they're malingerers, a lot of them, because they get better treatment on the psych ward than they do in the general institutional population. But it doesn't care if they're a malingerer or not, they still get lots of tranquilizers. <coughs> well, I did have to leave, and I, I, you know, I have a moral problem with it. But on the other hand, I figured, well, you know, at least I'm here. I was able to help a couple of people that if I hadn't been there, they wouldn't have been helped. You know, one guy would have an ocular gyrus crisis. Nobody else recognized it. I had that IED education. I recognized the guy was having an ocular gyrus crisis, you know, from too much tranquilizer. Mm -hmm. These docs weren't oriented towards too much tranquilizer. <laughs> 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 yeah, we have a couple more questions. <laughs> Hey, I think this gentleman right here is waiting. Yeah. A lot of your friend, uh, colleague uh, Christine, uh, have you experimented any with uh, Chinese herbals, those things with ginseng? Or? Well, yes, I use a few herbs. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, this is like a new world we've discovered here with the nutrients. I feel like we're really on the, the brink of what's really going to be <coughs> what already is the, the medicine. That we're all going to use because we it, it would be scientific about it because we can you know we, we've got to narrow down to the individual vitamins and nutrients it's like a whole new code whereas when you're working with herbs you're working with combinations of things many different things so you know we never really know well was it the vitamin c in that herb or was it the niacin in that herb or what was it in that herb that really worked so I think if we can stick to this nutrient concept, the orthomolecular concept, whatever we call it, I think that we'll be ahead of the game as far as being more scientific. Last question. Yes, sir. Uh, when you're talking about prisons, I was saying about your impulsive warrior type. What was the most 
thing I've heard about the chemistry of the warrior types is that the thyroid, the T3s, can be elevated in the impulse disorders. That's the only uh, biochemical correlate to the impulse disorders. How do you bring that down? Well, as I say, I would, I would normalize thyroid function just by giving them all the nutrients. Uh, because I, I just feel like that's, you know, including the iodine. Thanks very much, Mike. In case anybody else wanted a copy. Thank you all for coming. Don't forget next month. And uh, she'll